ICTJ are delighted to host today a, a, a real giant in the world of political and legal struggle. Albie Sachs has not only uh, played a huge and influential role in the development of the South African Constitution, but uh, worked as, uh, after being nominated by Nelson Mandela for 15 years in the new Constitutional Court. That success, of course, uh, came after a very difficult uh, and, and arduous path that included uh, imprisonment, exile and the survival of an assassination attempt and I don't think it's an a, um, exaggeration to say that both the personal voyage and the legal contribution has been a, a, an inspiration to human rights and uh, transitional justice uh, people the world over so we're delighted to welcome you Albie to, to this conversation. I just wanted to start off by asking you a little bit, uh, we were talking earlier and you uh, said you don't use the R word, so I'm not going to mention uh, the fact that you've moved into a different status since you left the court, but uh, can you give us a sense of what you've been working on since 2009 after you left the Constitutional Court? I, I spent 15 months in Kenya as a member of the Kenya Magistrates and Judges Vetting Board uh, interviewing all the judicial officers who were in office uh, when the new constitution came into, into force to see if they were suitable uh, to stay on in office. It was a very arduous, uh, very interesting, fascinating, grueling work uh, over 15 months. And before that I'd done writing, teaching, lecturing in many parts of the world, uh, very much in South Africa but also internationally. The work on the judicial vetting in, in Kenya, it's this issue of vetting is something that's not been uh, a huge success in transitional justice processes in a lot of countries. Um, do you see that this is a possible model that could be replicated in, in other countries at this point? I think hugely valuable experience was gained in Kenya. It was carefully prepared. Uh, it, it was based on a constitutional mandate. The people drafting the constitution wanted something done about the judiciary, a judiciary they could rely upon, uh, a judiciary that wouldn't be corrupt, that wouldn't be authoritarian, that wouldn't be in the pockets of those in power. And uh, Parliament then passed a law, very carefully debated and, and constructed, after extensive consultation with the judiciary itself to ensure that the process was fair. Uh, it was done in the public eye, uh, with built-in safeguards to ensure that it didn't become a new form of witch hunt, a purge, just getting rid of people or couldn't be manipulated for political advantage. Mm -hmm. It was a genuine project to distinguish those judges who deserved to stay on the bench, who had a big contribution to make, had a lot of experience that they could pass on, uh, to d distinguish them from the judges who had really betrayed their oath of office. Uh, all judges are supposed to act without fear, favor, or prejudice, but many judges in a gross way, manipulative way, had shown prejudice, had shown favor, some had been bribed, uh, others were extremely authoritarian, others twisted the law to protect those in power, to grant impunity. We had to find out who they were uh, and, and uh, based on secure evidence and, and ensure that we made a determination that they were unsuitable. To what extent did the South African experience inform the judicial vetting process in Kenya? Uh, we didn't have anything similar in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, the approach there was to allow the existing judiciary to stay in office while it was being transformed, uh, a completely new constitutional text, but to place a constitutional court right at the apex of the whole judicial system to ensure that the new values were, were properly uh, instilled, imbued into all exercises of, of public power. Uh, I don't think the problem in South Africa so much was manipulation of the law by the judges or taking of bribes. The problem was judges adhering to apartheid and supporting apartheid. Now apartheid was thrown out of the window and it was felt that in our circumstances maybe more damage would be done by wholesale exclusion than by um, requiring transformation to take place 
uh, in, in a fairly sort of steady way. It wasn't easy in South Africa. It isn't easy in South Africa. But I think each country has to adopt its own, its, its own modalities. I was thinking just to turn to South Africa for a moment when, uh, when in soft, uh, soft Vengeance of a Freedom Fighter that I think came out in 1991 originally um, that you wrote about the recovery from the assassination attempt and, and other issues. Um, the, the phrase soft vengeance, do you see that as a, a good description of South Africa's approach or do you see that as a description of your personal approach to, <laughs> to the legacy of apartheid? Well, I'm not so vain that I <laughs> identify myself with my country, but when I was blown up and I knew I was going to survive that moment that every freedom fighter is waiting for, will they come for me, will they come for me, if they do, will I be brave, will I get through? They tried to kill me and I, and I got through, I felt fantastic. And I had a total conviction as I got better, this was 1988, so South Africa would get better. But uh, that was just a personal conviction. But when I received a, a note recovering in hospital uh, saying, don't worry, Comrade Albi, we will avenge you. And I thought, are we going to cut off the arms, blind in one eye, the people who did this? Is that what we're fighting for? And I said to myself, if we get democracy, if we get the rule of law, if we get a country where people feel free and, and dignified as human beings, that will be my soft vengeance. And, and roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. Uh, and afterwards, when I heard that one of the persons planting the bomb in my car had been arrested, this was in Mozambique, and again, I'm lying in the hospital bed, and I said to myself, if he's put on trial, and the evidence is insufficient to prove his guilt, and he's acquitted, that will be my soft vengeance. It was more important to live under the rule of law than to have one rascal, more or less, uh, in, in jail. Mm. So the book that emerged was called The Soft Vengeance of a Freedom Fighter. Uh, and I certainly see it from my own personal point of view, uh, getting the wonderful constitution that, that we drafted as part of soft vengeance. Uh, getting democracy in South Africa, voting as equals for the first time, that part of soft vengeance. It's more powerful than hard vengeance. Hard vengeance is doing to them what they did to you. There's no difference except you're stronger. Or you might say your cause is better. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's still denying the possibilities of human beings living together as equals in the same country. That's what we aimed for and to quite a large extent we've achieved that. Mm -hmm. We haven't achieved equality in daily life. There are massive discrepancies in terms of wealth and, and confidence and access to resources, still based largely on, on, on color in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But we've got a great constitution mm -hmm. and the mechanisms to enable people to get on with their lives, mm -hmm. that, that's what I call soft vengeance. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you, I think you, were to some extent ahead of the, the curve in the uh, issues around uh, gender and discrimination work uh, with the, the book on sexism and the law back in the 70s. One of the issues that we deal with here quite frequently now is how do we deal with the issue of gender in transitional societies? How do we mainstream these issues? And the challenge is always looking at you've got entrenched discriminatory practices, how can transitional justice deal with those? Is that just part of the terrain of the legal and political struggle going forward or is that something we should deal with in, in transitional justice? Moments? Well, it's part of it, but it's not just part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the crucial thing is, is for the voices of women to be heard. And it's not a single voice because women are diverse and varied, but uh, these are powerful voices mm -hmm. and they have to be incorporated in the process of transition raise the issues that are very, very pertinent and, and important, whether it's constitution making, whether it's personnel involved in government institutions, that's important, and really changing the whole culture in society where you don't have a few patriarchal men deciding everything for everybody and imposing it on everybody and think they're being nice and kind to women by protecting them in a certain way. Uh, in, in South Africa, uh, the issue cropped up at the constitution-making level where the ANC insisted that of all the negotiating groups there had to be parity, 50-50 men and women. Uh, and it turned out to be very important. There are themes in the constitution that just would not have been there 
if women hadn't been direct participants. And possibly one of the most important moments in, in our whole process was when uh, Geraldine Fraser Moroketti, who's now a senior figure in the UNDP, uh, she was nursing her, her young baby. Uh, and she had a lot to say to the negotiators, and they didn't have a crash, so she took the baby into the negotiating chamber, and the little baby with the little whimpers every now and then, and, and the mama with the child at breast, became not just a, an imagined figure, but a real figure. Uh, and I must say many of us were thrilled that a bit of reality was now intruding on the abstract debates. And so the theme of rights for women, creating a non-sexist society, uh, was a theme sharply put on the table at, 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 at that stage. One of the conversations we were having earlier, I'm still thinking about South Africa, but looking more broadly at the challenges that a number of countries have faced since uh, is this issue of, of the balance between criminal punishment and some other forms of restorative justice and the degree, the question that's developing now that we were talking about is has international law moved to a position that requires criminal prosecutions? Is the uh, toolkit uh, uh, offering less tools for peace negotiations? And to what extent can restorative punishment methods be used in a, a more creative way in, in peace negotiations? Well, well certainly in, in South Africa, the Truth Commission, it's really based on restorative justice uh, underpinnings played a huge role in our transformation. It meant the truth came out. You didn't have the denial. The um, bodies were recovered. Decent burials were given. People learned about the last moments of their loved ones. Um, and there was that sense of public acknowledgement of terrible things that were done. It was enormously uh, positive and affirmative for the whole society. But it wasn't coupled with sending the people who came forward to testify what had happened to them, sending them to jail. That was the encouragement to enable the truth co to come out. That was our mechanism. However, if there hadn't been the threat of prosecutions, I'm not sure that so many people would have come forward with the truth. Uh, one big advantage of truth commissions is they can go much more widely than a criminal trial. A criminal trial just focuses on the culpability of that person. The causes, the background, the structural factors, the historical factors, cultural factors don't get examined at all. So you just know that one person more has been sent to jail or uh, been, been held culpable, which might or might not be important in certain circumstances. Uh, on the other hand, some conduct was so terrible and so beyond the limits of political conflict that amnesty was not given. I mean, so it's not an automatic thing, and it's not an either or or kind of situation. In Rwanda, after the terrible genocides, it was just impossible to even try and prosecute all the people. And so the village uh, encounters that had an enormous restorative effect that were really bypassing the ordinary uh, accusation and punishment uh, model, uh, I think played a very, very positive role and enabled the country to move forward without excluding the top level people from being prosecuted by the war crimes uh, tribunal. So I think there, there are many different variants that, that could be used and it's not a, a hard choice between the one or the other. One of the interesting things that we've come across in many countries is that, you know, in some countries you find people saying, we had no idea what was happening to other people. That uh, I worked in Guatemala for a few years and a lot of people in the city said, we had no idea that these massacres were being committed in the, in the mountains. I think in something like apartheid, that's probably less, it touched everyone, black or white, it touched everyone in some sense, didn't it? I'm wondering, what difference the form of repression and, and abuse makes to the, to the design of the mechanisms for, take, you know, how do you restore confidence in the institutions of the state? Do you think it makes a, the actual form of abuse makes a difference to the, the confidence restoring measures that we need to take? The form of abuse, the um, 
extent to which denunciations, exposures were possible. But I'm a little bit skeptical of we didn't know. And sometimes you didn't know because you shut your ears. Mm. Uh, I heard about Guatemala and I was far, far, far away from it. And lots of things were in the public media and in the press and Amnesty International and other bodies were, were campaigning on that. So uh, to me, the, the huge shift that a good Truth Commission type process makes is to move, as, as one American put it, from knowledge to acknowledgement. And acknowledgement is just knowing the facts, the details, but it's, it's abstract, it, it, it's statistics, it's accusations. Acknowledgement means it enters into your emotional world, your world of responsibility. Where was I? What was I doing? Why didn't I know? Why did I close my ears? What would I have done if I'd been in charge of the police, if I'd been one of the victims in prison? And, and it means the people enter into that realm with their imaginations, with their consciences, uh, to try and feel their way. Uh, that has a very powerful effect and impact uh, in relation to your moral citizenship and your understanding. And it also facilitates people to begin to live in the same country, not the same country physically, but the same country morally and, and emotionally. And I think any process, whether it's a criminal trial or a truth commission or some form of public investigation, uh, particularly if it's a very participatory one, that enables people to come to terms with, to imagine themselves into the situations in their own country, and now we're speaking about within living memory, uh, will be extremely important for enabling that country to knit together again afterwards. Thank you very much. I think we are uh, unfortunately out of time, so it's been a delight to talk to you, Albie. Thank you very much for that, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to speak to you again at some time in the future. Thank you.